let's talk about Minwax stains. I'm gonna show you my 10 favorite stains from Minwax and how they look on pine wood. So I did some calculations to see how much wood have I stained over the past three years since starting my career as a woodworker. It has been over, I mean, my calculation stopped at 100,000 feet. I've stained a ton of wood. I'm gonna share what works the best for me when I'm staining that big box pine, which is notoriously difficult to stain. There's a, a selection of materials that you're gonna need to get the best results. So the first one, obviously we talked about the wood. I use, this kind of big box pine. This is like a little swatch that I've made. I'm gonna be staining swatches. So it's kind of like a little door hanger for the color swatch. It's gonna be hanging on a hook and then it'll, it'll show what the different colors are. I obviously have a lot of these. So we're gonna talk about 10 different colors today, Minwax colors. I use the oil-based stain, which is in the yellow can. You can buy it at Lowe's. So Lowe's sell, sells Minwax, Home Depot sells Verithane stains. I've tried both. I definitely like Minwax the best and I like oil based the best. So we're going to get into that. Um, so you're going to need your wood. So again, this video is all about staining pine in particular. And when you stain different species of wood, the, the stain is going to appear a little bit differently because the wood itself looks a little bit different. So pine has this kind of more like golden yellow look to it. Um, and it has its own kind of grain. I usually use the pine that has like knots in it. One important thing to note is when you shop at like Home Depot or specifically Lowe's, you can, I think Home Depot has it as well. They have like the premium pine, which is very nice. It doesn't have any knots. It has like a very smooth surface. Now the important thing to know is that this is not premium pine, what, what I use. This is just like the regular one by, I, I made this out of like one by eights and just, just the standard version. I don't remember what it's called. You have to remember if you're using the premium pine, which is the one that's gonna feel really soft and silky in your hand, that t from my experience, that pine has been the most splotchy. Um, it's, it's just notorious for getting a really splotchy, uneven finish. So from my experience using the premium pine, you really, really have to sand it because it has almost like a coating of something that, that gives it that soft feeling. It says that it's ready to stain or paint, but I really strongly disagree with that. And that one you have to be even more aggressive with the sanding. So for my wood that I'm using today, I sanded, um, I started with 100 grit and then I went to 150 grit and that's where I stopped. Now the second thing is the rags you're going to use for staining. So there's a few different options. In theory, I believe you're supposed to use like a lint free rag um, or you can use a brush. I think now what I do, which is probably not suggested by anyone, but it works for me because I'm staining a lot of different things. I'm using a lot of different colors. So I actually use paper towels that are cut into small squares. So I cut paper towels into small squares and this is what I use to stain. Now there are other things like these, which I happen to have, I've never actually used them to stain, but I bought these at like Home Depot or something like that. There's also this as an option, which is, this is a lint free cloth. It's disposable as well. To be honest with you, I just use the paper towels. I cut them up to try to like not be so wasteful, but I'm just staining so many different things that I just don't have the ability to use rags and let them dry and reuse them or deal with the oil-based stain is very difficult to deal with if you wanted to reuse the rags. So now the important thing is like paper towels are obviously not lint free. So you have to be mindful when you're staining and know that they will kind of break down and it, and it can leave like lint or pieces on your, on whatever your piece that you're staining. So you have to pay attention to that for sure. I cut them apart with the scissors because I find that that gives a cleaner edge and then there's not as much like lintiness coming off the edge ver versus if you just rip the paper towel apart. So, so that's what I use. Now the other seriously important thing to know about staining and about the rags is that oil-based stains are extremely flammable and if you just leave your rags crumpled up somewhere, they can spontaneously combust. And this is like a very real, legitimate, Thing that can happen and has happened to a lot of people and people have burnt their entire shop down from from this stain rag so you have to make sure that you 
lay them flat, keep them spread out. Don't crumple them up. Don't pile them together in a bunch. Don't just throw them in the garbage can. This is a really serious safety note. So you, before you stain, do your, do your research and make sure you know that you're properly handling your stain rags so that you're not starting any, no, no fires are starting in your shop or your home or wherever you're doing this. The next thing that I use are rubber gloves. So with rubber gloves, when you're using oil-based stain, you wanna make sure that you're using the nitrile gloves. You don't want latex. I've made the mistake of buying a huge case of 1,000 latex gloves, not realizing that the oil-based stain will break down the latex and it will be leaking all over your hands. Like it will eat through the glove literally and it, you will have it all over your hands do not stain without anything on your hands like your hands will literally be stained your nails will be a disaster you definitely don't want to do that so get yourself some good gloves that are going to work well for the project um you know your work area so i always use you know some of my workbenches have been thoroughly loved and filled with stain so there's some places where i don't really care about protecting my surfaces but there are other places where i do care and so i use like some scrap cardboard from boxes and just give myself a place to set out my product where the excess stain like it's okay if it gets on the cardboard it's not going to ruin anything also along that note you want to wear like an apron or something because stain will splatter and because it's stain it's literally going to stain your clothes Okay, so on the other the other point about preparing your like work surface where you're going to set the stained product because it obviously needs time to dry and the stain needs to cure. So I create these little things. This is just like a little piece of scrap wood which I've put a nail in it. And this is kind of like acts as, um, I think they're called like a tent or something. They, they sell these in the store, but you don't, you don't need to buy it. You can just make something very simply yourself. I have a whole bin of them that I've made. Try to use a skinnier nail if you don't want um, it to leave. Like it, it will leave a little ring, so you wanna make sure if you're gonna be using, if the back part of your piece is gonna be visible, maybe this this method isn't gonna work for you. And then the other important thing, thing to note is that if you're resting your piece on this, then the end, which is touching your bench or your, this bottom part is going to the stain will be a little lighter because it's resting on there so it's like you're not getting a really even look right there on this bottom edge where it's resting so also keep that in mind the next important thing with staining is that oil-based stains give off a really strong odor and fumes so you need to wear the proper mask and you can't just wear a dust mask for this. That's not really going to do anything. You have to get like one of these kind of heavy duty masks. Specifically that is for like vapors or this kind of like VOCs. Which are released with oil based stains. So get yourself a good mask and also make sure you have proper ventilation. Like I definitely wouldn't. I mean I'm in my wood shop so I have pretty good ventilation here which is technically inside my house so I do stain in here but you really need to have proper ventilation because it will fill up your whole house with the the smell of stain so do it outside if you can or in your garage or someplace away from your living space otherwise you're gonna be breathing in those fumes and if you have to do it inside Get yourself like a fan going and open a cross breeze so that it, you can have good ventilation there. The other thing I want to know on this front is that if you do stain in your house, which I had, it took me a while to figure out why this was happening to me, but if you are staining inside, know that if you have a gas dryer and you go to dry your clothes when like the stain fumes are in the air, your clothing is gonna come out like smelling like you washed it at a mechanic shop. Like it's gonna have that kind of like oily mechanic auto body kind of shop, uh, smell to it. So, so I had to figure out, I, I thought my dryer was broken. I was like, why are my clothes smelling like this? Like when I take them out. But I realized it's because the, the fumes from the stain, if you do it in your house, it kind of like burns up in the dryer this is for a gas dryer maybe it's it's not true for an electric one but um it will make your clothes smell horrible so another consideration if you're staining in your house try not to try to avoid doing laundry until like the the air is cleared now with the actual stain as i mentioned i use minwax something very important when you're staining pine is this 
you have to use this pre-stain wood conditioner as your first step. So on your sanded wood, you wanna use the wood conditioner. This will allow the, this helps the stain to adhere in a more even way, especially with pine. The wood conditioner is like non-negotiable when you're staining pine, definitely go for this. If you're, I think Verathane also has this kind of product as well. So it's pre-stain conditioner, wood conditioner, it's called something like that and it's used as a first step. And then next step is obviously you're gonna choose the color of stain that you want. This is Early American. This is one of my favorite and best selling co colors in my shop. Um, but we're gonna go, as I mentioned, we're gonna go through 10 different stains that I like the best and that I that I offer for the products in my shop. And then in addition to that, we're gonna go through five extra colors, which are mixes of stains. So mixing a couple different colors to get something unique that's just like, you can't find it on the shelf. Mixing is just unlocks a whole new world in terms of stain and you can, you can really get the color that you're looking for by mixing different colors together. After you've stained, you want to let your stain cure for 24 hours. This is really important because if your stain is not fully cured, when you go to put your top coat on, it's just gonna, you're gonna have issues with the top coat really coming out the way that you want it to. So I use polycrylic from also from Minwax, which is a water-based top coat, and it gives a really nice finish. I use the satin version they have satin they have semi-gloss i think they have a, a matte one and then maybe a gloss as well i'm not sure i like i stick with the satin i like how it feels it's just very satiny the way you know it's fully cured and obviously this is going to be very dependent on the conditions especially the humidity it takes longer to cure in a more humid humid environment um so if you're doing it outside you know it's best if you could bring it inside to fully cure after you've stained it and after some of the odors have gone away and stuff like that. Like just bring it inside and let it cure in the AC, especially if you're doing it in the summertime. What I've learned is that it really needs like a full 24 hours. And then when I go to top coat it with my polycrylic, then I just get like a beautiful, nice top coat, even with just one coat of polycrylic. If I try to coat it too soon, when the stain's not fully cured, and you're gonna know the stain is not fully cured because when you rub the, the piece of stained wood, it's gonna kind of leave a little bit of residue on your fingers when it's cured it'll just it'll feel more cured it might still feel like a little bit sticky-ish because it's been stained and it's not top coated but you're not going to get like a huge smear of stain on your hand on the back of the stain can i think it says you can top coat it after two hours but i just really don't find that to be the case if i top coat the wood too soon then it's like the polycrylic just like soaks in and it doesn't give me that nice satiny finish. I have to recoat it again and then it just, it, it always ends up looking weird. So I find that giving it more time to dry and cure it results in just a much better finish overall. Okay, and then one more thing to note is I use these little paper lunch bags. You can use any kind of paper bag that you can just wad it up. Um, so because I meant, as I mentioned, I use the paper towels to stain and sometimes there's like, there is going to be like a little bit of lint. Obviously like it's, it's nothing crazy, but if you rub your hand across the surface, you might feel like a little bit of linty residue. It's, it's not going to affect your, your stain finish. Obviously if it, there's like big chunks falling off, you don't want to leave those on cause that can affect the finish of your stain as it dries. But for the most part, if you're paying attention with the paper towel, like you're gonna be golden. Um, but I do use the paper bag after it's cured, before I'm gonna top coat it, I just crumble up the paper bag. It acts kind of like as a sandpaper, but like a really light sandpaper. And I just rub over my piece with the paper bag. Like that to make sure that any little dusty anything is off of my surface and then I go ahead and top coat it. And then after I top coat it and you let it dry, the top coat I would say, again, it depends on humidity, but I would say within an hour, it's pretty much usually dried to the touch. Like within an hour or two, I mean, it dries very quickly, the polycrylic does, but I try to give it a little bit more time, but within an hour or two, it's pretty much ready to be handled. And then again, after it's been top coated, I go at it again with the paper towel and just, it'll it'll smooth out your surface. Cause it might, even once it's top coated, it might still have like a little bit of a rough texture, but going in with the, the paper bag 
just really smooths it out. So again, remember to crumple the paper bag up in your hand, make it kind of softish and then, and then do it. That's why I like using these little lunch bag sizes because it's thin. It's not like a grocery store paper bag. It's thin enough that you can crumple it up and it has a pretty soft texture on its own. But if you do that, obviously test a little surface first, but I never have issues with like it leaving scratches or marks or anything, but definitely test the back just to make sure whatever you're doing, it's not gonna leave any marks or any scratches or anything on the surface. But for me, it, it's always worked fine and it, it just gives you like a nice, more polished feel after you do the top coat. So paper bag before top coating and after. Obviously use a clean one after, you don't wanna use one that has stain on it to you know rub on your top coat. And then one last note on the polycrylic, I usually do one coat because most of the products that I'm making are just simple home decor products that are hanging on the wall. It's not something that's being handled or heavily used. Certainly if you're doing like furniture or a chair or something like that, you, you definitely want additional coats. One coat is probably not gonna be enough and not certainly not enough protection if it's gonna be like around water. There are some, some things that I make that like are designed to go in the kitchen. So on those types of things, I use two coats just to give it a more durable finish. All right, our stain colors. So first we have natural stain. Natural stain on pine just really looks pretty much like the raw pine itself, the unfinished, unstained pine. As you can see, it's more of a golden tone. It's nice. Um, you have to like that kind of more yellowish golden look to, to enjoy this stain, but this is natural stain. We're gonna go from lightest to darkest with the stain finishes. The next color is fruit wood. I really like fruit wood. It's, it's very nice. I think this is actually one of the newer colors from Minwax. It is kind of like this peachy, very similar to the natural, but it has like more of a light tan peachy tone to it. So fruit wood is a really good option if you, if you like the woods on the lighter end of the spectrum. The next color is weathered oak. So weathered oak is a stain. By itself, it's nice. It's kind of like a lightish gray color with a little bit of hints of, of brown in it. Slightly tannish, grayish color. But the cool thing about weathered oak, which we're gonna get to later, is that it mixes really, really well with other stain colors. Um, so you can mix it with like special walnut or early American and it just gives the, the stain a really nice aged look because it has those gray tones in it. So this is weathered oak. Next is special walnut stain. Special walnut and early American, which is gonna be coming up next, they're very similar. They're both like a medium brown tone. To my eye, special walnut looks a little bit cooler. It doesn't have as much of those like warm, orangey kind of undertones, but it's very, very similar to early American, just a, a medium brown color, but special walnut's a little less orangey, whereas early American has a little bit more of the oranginess to it. So this is special walnut. And then Early American, as I mentioned, also a medium brown, but definitely very warm toned. More of like an orangey kind of t undertones with, with Early American. Early American is probably the most popular stain color in my online shop. And yeah, this is by far the best seller. So it's, it's just a really good brown tone. Next is English Chestnut. English chestnut is also a brown, but it has a pretty strong reddish tone to it. So definitely a really strong reddish tone to the English chestnut, but also a beautiful color. Mixes well, we're gonna get into that with the mixes shortly. Next for our darker option, this is Jacobine. So Jacobine is the darkest brown. I think this is the darkest brown that Minwax does. It's very deep, it's kind of like almost like a coffee brown. I really like this for a deep a deep brown, but still like it's brown. It's not like you don't feel that it's black, although it is quite dark. So this is Jacob Bean. This is really nice. Also mixes really well with some lighter colors. If you wanna make those lighter colors just go like a little bit deeper, we have a couple of Jacob Bean mixes coming up as well. Okay, next we have gray. This is simple, simply gray, I believe it's called. 
classic gray let me check yes this is called classic gray so this is a, a nice gray tone it has a little bit of the tannish undertones but also it's kind of a bluish gray a little bit of a bluish vibe with the classic gray stain so classic gray looks looks pretty good it's it's again has like a little bit more of a bluish tone to it so so make sure you know that if you're going to choose classic gray next is aged barrel this is also a newer stain i believe from minwax so this is like a more recent option that i added to my shop but it's kind of cool again has like a bluish tone it's almost like navy but then it's also like a charcoal gray it's like a cross between navy and like a charcoal color so this is aged barrel looks really nice finally for our to round out our our 10 classic minwax stain colors is true black this is true black it's a black stain it's um it it does it'll show the grain depending on the piece of the wood like sometimes it, it shows up really really black sometimes you can see a little bit more of the grain coming through so the the wood grain will kind of look a little bit more like light brownish tannish color for this piece, it's a pretty solid black. I mean, you can definitely see the grain, but the color variation in the grain, you can't, it's not really visible. So this is a good color. For, if you want something black, simply black is a, or tr sorry, true black is a great option. I like true black a lot. This is, this is pretty popular option for people that don't really like the more like woodsy looking colors. All right, so those are the 10 classic Minwax colors. Now we're gonna get into the mixes. When I'm mixing the stains, I always use just like a plastic little teaspoon. This way you can kind of get your measurements more standardized by using like a, a vessel that'll, you know, you know, I'm okay, I'm using two teaspoons of this and two teaspoons of that or one teaspoon of that. You can kind of like develop your recipe and it's a little bit more predictable when you're using just the same vessel versus instead of just kind of dumping it out and trying to figure it out. Um, so you can repeat your mixes in the future and, and get pretty much the same color. So the first mix is a really cool mix. I like this mix. It's early American and weathered oak. So it's a I did a one to one ratio early american and weathered oak so it's very similar to the early american stain the difference is that it lightens it up a little bit but it also adds kind of like an aged feeling from the weathered oak stain as i mentioned weathered oak mixes really well with with different stain colors and it just gives it that aged kind of feeling on its own it's not my favorite stain weathered oak but mix it together with other stains and it's like it's really cool it's great i always recommend it if people send me pictures of things like it's almost always going to include weathered oak in the, in the mix to match so this is early american and weathered oak one to one ratio next we have special walnut and gray this is nice it's almost kind of like a taupe color nice tannish taupey kind of brown so for this one i did also a one to one ratio of special walnut and classic gray stain so this kind of turned out to this taupey brown i like this a lot the next stain mix if you want kind of more of like a medium darkish brown is special walnut mixed with jacobine so jacobine mixes really well with stains if you want the tone to just be a little bit darker just mix in a little bit like even just a half a teaspoon of like one part two parts to one part jacob bean you can you can kind of tone down the color a little bit so this brings it down into more of like the medium dark kind of category of brown so this is a nice color this is special walnut mixed with jacob bean and this is two parts special walnut one part jacob bean next one i love this one a lot um this is english chestnut mixed with jacob bean so this this mix it really tones down the reddish tones of the english chestnut which english chestnut on its own like it's pretty red um but when you when you mix it together with the jacob bean it really tones it down a lot and i was showing somebody a picture of something that i made with this stain color and they, they actually thought it was walnut even though it was pine stained in this finish so if you're looking to kind of complement walnut, this could be a good choice. Again, this is English chestnut mixed with jacobine, and it's two parts English chestnut, one part jacobine. Okay, the final stain mix that I prepared for this video is aged barrel and jacobine, one to one ratio. Aged barrel and jacobine, it's kind of, it makes it a little bit more charcoaly 
than than the aged barrel on its own but it, it kind of takes away those blue tones that the aged barrel had so this is aged barrel and jacob bean thank you so much for tuning into this video i hope you got some helpful tips for your next staining project and please subscribe to my channel and give this video a thumbs up and i look forward to seeing you in future videos